welcome to the Mondo Weiss podcast. I'm your host, Dave Reed. At Mondo Weiss, we cover the movements, activists, and policymakers who affect the struggle for freedom in Palestine. In May 2021, fighting broke out between Palestinian resistance groups in Gaza and the Israeli military. 300 Palestinian residents of Gaza were killed, including 66 children, and thousands more were injured. The United Nations Human Rights Council set up a commission of inquiry to identify the root causes of the violence. On June 7th of this year, the commission presented its first report to the Human Rights Council. Unlike past UN commissions of inquiry on violence between Israelis and Palestinians, the mandate of this commission is not time-limited. It is not subject to annual renewal, and it is not restricted to examining the immediate circumstances that led to its formation. Rather, it was told to take its time and examine the underlying root causes of recurrent tensions. In further contrast with past commissions and special rapporteurs on the occupied Palestinian territories, this commission has been tasked with examining the situation in both the occupied Palestinian territories and, in the words of the commission's June report, Israel itself. The commission is led by several highly experienced leaders in international law, including Meloun Qatari, who served as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Adequate Housing with the Human Rights Council. In the wake of the commission's first report, Mondo Weiss contributor David Kattenberg spoke with Meloun Qatari. His views were both candid and cutting. Hello, Milun Katari. Thank you so much for joining me. Greetings, yeah. Can you uh, introduce yourself briefly, tell me who you are, and a little bit about the special uh, commission of inquiry and what it is, but to start by introducing yourself. Yes, yes, it's very good to be on this uh, program. I, uh, my name is Milun Katari. I'm a scholar activist from India. Uh, I've been working on human rights for the last uh, 30 odd years. Uh, I've been primarily focusing on uh, economic, social, and cultural rights, so the issue of housing, land, uh, displacement, evictions. I was formerly a uh, special rapporteur on adequate housing with the UN uh, Human Rights Council from 2000 to 2008. And I've also um, set up several civil society organizations uh, in India. And lately, I've been doing quite a lot of work on the Universal Periodic Review, which is a peer review mechanism at the Human Rights Council where the comprehensive human rights record of all UN member states is assessed every four and a half years. Um, and uh, quite a lot of training on, on the UN with governments, with national human rights institutions, with UN teams, with civil society. Um, and I was appointed um, in July last year to uh, the commission, established, the Human Rights Council established um, an independent inquiry commission. Uh, to investigate uh, human rights issues in in the occupied Palestinian territories, but also in uh, inside the Green Line in, in Israel. And there are some very unique features uh, to this Commission of Inquiry, which I can speak about later. So we are three commissioners. Uh, the chair of the commission is Navi Pillai from South Africa, who was formerly High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, and the, th- and, uh, the third member is Chris Sidoti, who is an expert on national human rights institutions, and he's from Australia. Uh, so the three of us comprise this commission of inquiry. And uh, what I wanted to raise are that there's several unique features to this commission. The, the Human Rights Council, of course, has had commissions of inquiry on the occupied territories before. I think there were seven of them. Um, what distinguishes our commission, and in a way, I would consider our redeeming features is first of all that it's an ongoing mandate. Uh, earlier commissions were annual, you know, had to be renewed annually, but we are an ongoing mandate, which gives us, you know, the scope to do sort of longer term thinking, visioning, looking at historical issues. Um, so that temporal scope is very important. And that's what has caused some concern amongst uh, certain countries. We can get into that. The second important aspect is that we have been asked to look at um, root causes of the conflict. So we are not looking necessarily at specific instances of violations, but we are looking at um, at uh, root causes uh, uh, of recurrent tensions, instability, and protraction of the conflict, uh, including systematic 
discrimination and repression based on uh, national, ethnic, racial, or religious identity. So that's a very important aspect of our mandate, which al- allows us to take a historical perspective, which allows us to look at you know, the history of uh, settler colonialism, to look at issues of discrimination, and to look at issues of what are the consequences uh, historically and what have been the accumulated consequences of occupation uh, by Israel. Uh, the third aspect, which is very important, is the geographical scope. Um, you know, we have a, a previous uh, commission of inquiry uh, and the work of the UN Special Rapporteur on the Occupied Territories uh, were limited to the occupied areas, so essentially West Bank and, and Gaza. But our mandate includes uh, Israel. So it includes all areas inside the green line. So essentially we are looking at the human rights situation from the river to the sea. Uh, which is also very important because that's a critical aspect of, you know, what has what has gone wrong in a sense. In your report, you you, you refer there's a phrase in there about Israel itself. Some refer to kind of quaintly as Israel proper, uh, when in fact, I mean, anybody who goes and travels there, as I have just recently, knows that the Green Line is largely fictitious. It's been erased. That Israel Israel is really for all intents and purposes, a single state from the river to the sea. And and in your commission, in your report, uh, you talk about the compelling linkage between what goes on in the occupied territories, quote-unquote, and what goes on inside Israel itself. So thoughts on this? Well, yeah, I I think uh, you're absolutely right, of course. But, uh, you know, in terms of the sort of governance issues, the functioning of the state, the the national laws in terms of, you know, what Israel itself recognizes as as the state, in terms of what the United Nations recognizes as the state of Israel as a member of the United Nations. Um, I think there is a there is a distinction that has to be made. Now you're absolutely right that when we look at the kinds of discrimination inside the green line when we look at you know the historical sort of occupation issues um, th- there are many many similarities but we have to treat it differently and the reason we are you know obviously wanting to make the linkages is precisely because of the point you raised that actually what has uh, transpired in the occupied territory since 67 is something that had already been happening inside the green line uh, since 48 you know the, the levels of discrimination the different laws the dispossession uh, of, of Palestinian Israelis um, so I think it's important to to make that distinction but then also to to draw the parallels uh, because that's that's something that the UN has not uh, successfully been able to do because the earlier mandates, uh, only included the occupied territories, except for the work of the United Nations treaty bodies. You mentioned the Committee on the Human Rights Committee. But then they were limited to only looking at inside the Green Line. And uh, so we have an opportunity to to make that uh, historical link and to, you know, to see how the entire area has to be treated in terms of redressing the violations that are there. Now, in your interim report, which you presented to the to the, the Human Rights Council in early June, um, th- this was essentially a review of of past findings, determinations, and findings and recommendations from a host of other UN human rights bodies and and mechanisms and so forth. This was not a work of your own analysis so much as it was a review of past findings. Could you comment on that, like methodologically? The bottom line is that none of the findings and recommendations, the myriad recommendations made by past human rights bodies and mechanisms have been abided by by Israel. Israel's ignored everything, and it's done so with complete impunity. Right. Well, that's correct. Uh, But uh, first of all, the resolution from the Human Rights Council that uh, created our mandate uh, explicitly asked us to uh, draw out the essence from all the earlier work that had been done uh, by the human rights bodies. So we actually went beyond, we we didn't look at only the commissions on inquiry, but we also looked at the work done by historically by the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on Occupied Territories. We looked at the work done by treaty bodies, uh, 
that are monitoring, you know, different treaties that Israel has ratified uh, and is reporting on. But I just want to say that that was not the only uh, part covered in the report. We also had, uh, we had done a mission to Amman. We had taken, you know, we had heard testimonies from 30 individuals who came from uh, inside the Green Line, who came from Gaza and the West Bank. Uh, we had leaders of civil, both Jewish and Palestinian civil society. We had ministers uh, from the Palestinian Authority. We had academics from inside Israel. Um, and uh, so it was partly based on that. We also did quite a few online interviews uh, because, you know, we are not allowed to go into the areas. Israel would not allow you into the country, nor would Egypt allow you entry into Gaza. So far they haven't, uh, but we keep trying. But Israel from the beginning has said they will not uh, cooperate uh, with the mandate. And uh, even our attempts to meet um, with the Israeli ambassador in Geneva have, you know, uh, have received no response. Uh, so that is there. So, so we have to collect our data and our evidence uh, based on people that we can interview in the surrounding countries. And we will be visiting Lebanon, we'll be visiting Egypt, uh, possibly Syria, continuing to do this work. And we are hoping that we will be allowed um, into Gaza at some point. And, and, and we haven't, you know, we are, we are hoping also that Israel will allow us in, um, in inside the Green Line and to go to the West Bank, uh, because we feel that our mandate also asks us to look at violations on the, the other side. So we look at violations by uh, the Gaza authorities, violations done by the Palestinian authorities. Um, and, and we can only look at that, uh, you know, systematically and with some level of accuracy if Israel allows us, allows us in and we can visit the areas where the rockets have created uh, damage and where people have suffered. Um, and, and we are also hoping, you know, Israel keeps talking about well, our mandate is not accurate, our perspective is not correct. So we, you know, if they feel that they have a story to tell, uh, they should let us in and, and tell us uh, their perspective on, on the whole situation. So we are hoping, we keep trying, we'll keep trying, and we hope that, uh, that they will allow us in at, uh, at one point. But Israel has, never, Israel has never allowed any commission of inquiry or investigating group or UN body committee or UN special rapporteur, not since Richard Falk, they don't let them into, into the country. But, but David, there's one, I mean, there are some exceptions. Uh, I was actually part of a, a four rapporteur mission in 2006, you know, when there was a crisis with Lebanon and uh, we visited Lebanon. We looked at the impact of Israel's cluster bombs and then we requested Israel to allow us in and they actually did. So four, rapport, four UN rapporteurs traveled. Uh, we went to the Galilee. We interviewed families that had been affected by Hezbollah rockets. Um, so there is there is a precedence there. Uh, so it's it's not. And then uh, Navi Pillai, when she was uh, high commissioner, uh, actually did an official mission to Israel as well, and she was allowed to go to the occupied territories. Uh, so so you know, I mean, if they want to, they can. It's not uh, it's not unprecedented, and we're hoping we're hoping that they will. And they totally ignore all the recommendations, all the recommendations made by the, the Human Rights Committee and the, the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights and of the Special Rapporteur. They just ignore them. Yeah, that, that was our finding that... Uh, and they do so with impunity. With impunity, and they've been um, overwhelmingly, uh, you know, ignored. And in fact, one of our conclusions is that because these recommendations have been uh, consistently ignored, it has uh, it has been one of the causes of fueling the conflict, uh, and and a cause for you know great despair amongst the amongst the Palestinians. But what is also very interesting about the recommendations, we found that um, that overwhelmingly they have been um, directed towards Israel. So which actually also shows the asymmetrical uh, nature of the conflict, and and you know it's even it. It even being called conflict actually raises a lot of questions. Uh, so, so that's you know that's what we were that's what we are trying to show. And uh, and and the other conclusion that we've reached, which we think is very important to continue to stress, is that uh, Israel has no uh, intention of ending the occupation and the pers persistent discrimination 
against the Palestinians lies at the heart of the systematic uh, recurrence of violations um, in the occupied territories in East, East Jerusalem and in and in uh, and in Israel. And you note down here in your assessment, you wrote. Uh... The commission notes the strength of prima facie credible evidence available that convincingly indicates that Israel has no intention of ending the occupation uh, and has clear policies for ensuring complete control over the occupied Palestinian territory and is acting to alter the demography through the maintenance of a repressive environment for Palestinians and a favorable environment for Israeli settlers. So, You've re, you've confirmed or cited Michael Wink's comments that the occupation is now it's permanent. It's an occupation of perpetuity. I mean, this is illegal, is it not? Yes, it's it's uh, it's been illegal from the beginning. And in fact, one of our mandates is to look at the um, you know the role of both humanitarian law, human rights law, criminal law, um, and on on all three counts, uh, Israel is in is in systematic violation. Of, of all the legislation. And in fact, uh, I mean, I would go as far as to raise the question is why are they even a member of the United Nations? Because uh, they don't respect, uh, the Israeli government does not respect its own obligations as a UN member state. Uh, they, in fact, consistently, uh, either directly or through uh, the United States, uh, try to undermine UN mechanisms. Uh, you might know at this session of the council when we presented our report, the United States, uh, which is a you know become a member of the council again, circulated a statement signed by 22 countries um, objecting to our um, our mandate, and that actually shows great disrespect uh, for the body that uh, the the United States is a member of. Because once you're a member of a body, and a body has adopted. A mechanism you have to you have to respect it. You cannot then say, "Oh, you know, we were not there last year, or we don't agree with it now." And 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 also, it's a. I mean, we are quite surprised in a way. We are. Um, I would say we are also glad that our commission of inquiry has received so much notice. Uh, as you you might know, just a few weeks ago, the I think in the Senate there's a bill that's been presented in the U.S. which which is called the Elimination of the COI Act. And, and the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, has, you know, gone out on uh, criticizing the thing. He has to report back to Congress next year on what the U.S. has done to to eliminate our commission. Uh, I mean, none of that is succeeding. Uh, the U.S. Uh, failed quite badly at the council this year to do anything to us uh, because we have over it. And I was going to ask about that. I mean, your, your, your chairperson, uh, Ms. Piway, has been specifically the target of attacks in Canada. The Canadian government has apparently um, expressed its displeasure with Ms. Piway's presence as chair. Uh, yeah, that's very, we think it's very unfortunate uh, to attack individual members of the commission who have been appointed through a, you know, long and rigorous process. And um, I think, I think it's just a way to try to discredit, uh, discredit the council, but, but it's a, uh, it, it's very. I think it's very counterproductive because, well, first of all, it brings more attention to our work, uh, and also it brings more support. I mean, at the council this year, we had overwhelming support of uh, the UN member states. Uh, the US got, you know, twenty two uh, twenty two states to sign, but that's twenty two out of one hundred and ninety three. Uh, that's not very much, um, and, and also I think that. Uh, it's not only uh, governments, uh, but we are re- we are very um, disheartened by the social media that is controlled largely by whether it's the Jewish lobby or it's whether specific NGOs. A lot of money is being thrown into uh, trying to discredit us. But but you know the you know David the important thing is that our mandate is based on international human rights st- and humanitarian standards, and we are all seeking the truth. Uh, and and we feel that, you know, based on the evidence that we have, overwhelming evidence, I think it's one of the most well-documented conflicts in the world um, historically, based on that evidence, based on the international law, if people feel that we are biased, then we are biased. But but for us, that's uh, that's the job we've been given to do, and that's what we're doing. But international law is not a term of reference in, in, in the context of what's referred to as the peace process. Uh, since the early 1990s, international law is completely off the table. 
Uh, yeah, well, that was a that was a serious flaw uh, in the Oslo process and so on. Uh, but I think it's not. It's very much been on the table with uh, all the UN human rights bodies, uh, and it's very much uh, the standard by which uh, the behavior of Israel is is assessed uh, all over the world. So it's very very relevant. But it's it's not a term of reference for the U.S. government, nor for the Canadian government nor for the, the European Union. The, the EU talks with greater conviction about the role of international law in this quote-unquote conflict, but international law is completely off the table in Ottawa and in Washington. Yeah, but that's, that's uh, I would consider that a problem with Canada and the United States. It's not a problem for the world. I mean, we have all come together in the UN and Israel itself has ratified these instruments. It's not, I mean, if, if there was, if it was not a term of reference, why would Israel ratify? Why would they report to the UN treaty bodies? You know, why would they come uh, to the Human Rights Council? Uh, so I think there's a, there's a, a, a duplicity there. There are double standards. When it comes to Ukraine, uh, David, international law becomes very, very important. Uh, in fact, it's used as the standard by even by the United States, but most certainly by the European Union, uh, also by the International Criminal Court. Um, and, and they are pushing ahead and pointing out all the violations done by Russia. But, but the same violations of occupation and dispossession uh, done by Israel do not receive the same treatment. So there, there is a serious double standard here, which, uh, which, needs to be, which needs to be exposed. I'm wondering if the Professor Qatari, if the uh, apartheid idea came up in the course of your deliberations leading to this 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 interim report because the, the term apartheid doesn't appear uh, anywhere although you, you do it at paragraph 45 there's a quote from the, the the human rights committee concluding observations on the covenant on civil and political rights is that israel quote israeli domestic legal framework maintains a three-tiered system of laws affording different civil status, rights, and legal protections for Jewish, Israeli citizens, Palestinian citizens of Israel, and Palestinian residents of East Jerusalem. This is apartheid. Uh, yes, well, there's, a, there's actually been a lot of pressure on us to, you know, give our opinion on that. And uh, we deliberated on it. We felt that uh, we were not ready because we need to reach our own conclusions after after deep study and analysis, uh, which we haven't had time. We also feel, and I think we've stated that, that we do not think it's a, uh, it's a useful uh, paradigm, it's a useful framework, but we don't think it's sufficient to capture the enormity of what has happened in the area. So it doesn't look, for example, at the whole history of settler colonialism. It doesn't look at the whole issue of occupation. Uh, it doesn't look at many other dimensions, which I think when we are asked to look at root causes uh, are, are very important to, to, to draw the full picture. Uh, just saying apartheid, just ending apartheid is not going to end occupation. Uh, you know, so, so there is a much, much deeper and a much more comprehensive uh, review that has to be done. And that's what we're doing. We, we will get to the apartheid question at some point in the future, because we will be looking at uh, discrimination in general, uh, you know, from the river to the sea. So, um, so I think we will. But at this point, we felt we were we were not uh, we were not neither we were ready nor in our initial assessment did we think it was a it was a sufficient uh, paradigm that we that we should only focus on that. You talked in in your interim report about developing a, a database or a repository of evidence that could be used uh, in subsequent judicial processes without getting too specific. Can you talk about that, about the, this repository and what your thoughts are about um, building building a case that could be taken to a judicial instance? Uh, well, yes, we, we have been actually uh, explicitly mandated to collect data, information, forensic material, uh, because we are an accountability body, we we uh, have to seek accountability. But we don't, and so we have to also work with other international bodies. So, for example, we are we will be working closely with the International Criminal Court, which, as you know, has opened a file on Palestine. Uh, we will also be looking at other methods of, you know, universal jurisdiction, uh, perhaps 
a role for the International Court of Justice. Uh, so our, our work is to collect a repository of all the evidence that we gather um, and then uh, at a particular time um, hand it over to the judicial bodies that can take action. So our, our role is, you know, much beyond just reporting and uh, so on. We have a, we have a very explicit uh, investigative role and our staff, our secretariat has, you know, very senior experts on on investigation, on legal, you know, jurisprudence and so on. Yes, we are beginning to collect that information. And are members or have members of your staff been in touch with uh, people in the International Criminal Court? Is there, Are there linkages now that have been established? Yes, yes. Actually, we have ourselves uh, visited there uh, last month uh, and met with the, uh, the deputy prosecutor. So the three commissioners have been to been to The Hague and... Uh, we, we are exploring exploring possibilities of working with them. Yes. Yeah, spoken with Ms. Kahn. That's right, yes. And her team. And her team. Yes, that's correct. You also speak in your, in your uh, uh, interim report about uh, uh, trying to convince state parties to the various legal instruments that they have a duty uh, on, under, for example, Article 1 of the common to the Geneva Conventions that country state parties must respect and ensure respect for the convention in all circumstances, uh, which they've not been doing. I mean, there's no better example than Canada. Canada's official position is that Israel's an occupying power in, in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights and Gaza, and that settlements are therefore illegal. It knows that settlements are therefore presumptive of crime under the Rome Statute, but Canada... Um, extends uh, um, aid and assistance to Israel's settlement enterprise, uh, economic, fiscal, and, and diplomatic. And of course, the United States does as well, and so does the European Union. So how, how, do you, how does the commission see its, uh, its role in trying to get state parties to abide by their own obligations? Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, well, first of all, our role uh, is to... Um, identify the obligations of, we have been, again, given explicitly the mandate to look at third party accountability, uh, which means to look at, you know, the high contracting parties of the Geneva Conventions, I mean, all the human rights instruments, whether they are complying with their uh, obligations, including what are called extraterritorial obligations. Um, And uh, we will be doing that in one of our subsequent reports. And we will also be examining, and that's, we have been asked, uh, the whole question of arms, arms transfer, uh, you know, which is a very, very serious issue that countries, you name some of them, there are others uh, who continue to supply um, arms to Israel, which are obviously also being used uh, to suppress the, you know, and to damage the Palestinian uh, population. So that's something we will be looking at, uh, at third party accountability. And I think that will be a uh, and it's not only arms and, you know, this, it's also the business interests. Uh, as you know, there's a business database on um, companies that operate in the occupied territories. Uh, so that's also uh, part of the third party accountability that uh, states allowing businesses that are registered in their countries um, to, you know, to operate and to promote uh, development in these areas, um, if primarily, you know, benefiting uh, the Jewish populations, um, including, you know, the work in the settlements. So, yes, we will be looking at that. Uh, that's absolutely part of our uh, our remit. And how, and how do you go about doing that? How does the Commission of Inquiry go about procedurally getting state parties to abide by their obligations? Well, I think the first step uh, is to identify what is the nature of that involvement and to identify the extent of you know the damage being done by that involvement, and and that's the first step we would take, and then and then to uh, obviously to discuss with the committees to raise the issue at the Human Rights Council uh, and see see what their response is. As you know, you know the the BDS uh, in uh, movement is there. As you know, some countries have taken steps to uh, to label you know products from the occupied territories. Uh, other countries are considering that. Uh, so I think it, our role is to expose the extent of third-party um, culpability um, in, in the occupied territories. And that's, that's what we will do. Um, 
including the arms issue, which I think, which we think is very important. And so your next step, uh, Professor Katari, is to, to move forward into your own investigation and legal analysis with a view to identifying those bearing individual criminal responsibility. When will this work begin? Well, we've already started. I mean, we're, we've started collecting information. And as I was mentioning, we will be visiting areas, taking testimony, uh, and, and you know, slowly proceeding with that work. Uh, it's, it's not something that will suddenly appear in a report. Uh, it's something we have to uh, accumulate uh, over, over, over some years and see when it is uh, time to share that information uh, with, the relevant, uh, with the relevant authorities. But but uh, our our work has already begun, and and toward at the very end of your report, you say that the commission will seek to engage with the, the wider Palestinian diaspora. This is fifty percent of the Palestinian population reside outside of the occupied territories. This is interesting. You propose to speak to Palestinians in the United States and Canada and throughout the Middle East and Australia and all those places. Yes, yes, very much. Uh, so we will be speaking to the Palestinian diaspora in in Lebanon, in uh, in Jordan, uh, in Egypt, in Syria, and also wherever we go, uh, possibly in the U.S. as well. And and that's one way for us to um, collect the information that we need because there are refugees that have, of course, historically been dispossessed from the occupied territories, but there are even recent uh, arrivals who who can give us a lot of information. I mean, we are getting a lot of information already from with all the new technology available. Uh, we are using, we are working with the UN Satellite Agency. We're looking at other forms of getting information if we cannot travel there. Um, there's quite a lot of uh, geospatial data, data that is available, which very clearly shows, for example, which uh, we hope to uh, share in our report to the General Assembly, which shows the, uh, the evolution, uh, the extent to which the occupation has been um, solidified in, 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 in the West Bank and, and the damage is being done by, for example, the blockade on, on Gaza. My last question, Maloon Katari, and thank you so much for your time. There is a, a yawning gulf, a huge chasm between the ideas that are conveyed in, in this interim report from the Special Commission of Inquiry and from other reports that have been produced by UN human rights bodies and special rapporteurs. This is a huge gulf between what they say, talking about profound, systematic, comprehensive, chronic violations of, of international humanitarian and human rights law by state of Israel on the one hand, and on the other hand, statements that we hear from, well, Joe Biden was asked just the other day, you know, what do you think about Israeli apartheid? And he said he he denies it and he insists that Israel is a, a shining democracy, a light unto the world. And of course, you know, Justin Trudeau in Canada says the same thing. You know, the governments of uh, the European Union say the same thing. So on the one hand, you see the international human rights community, you know, saying one thing, and it's completely at odds with what the state parties are saying. So how does the committee, uh, the, co- the commission wrap its head around this? Is this demoralizing? Is this uh, disconcerting? No, no, it's not demoralizing, David. It, it's disconcerting. It, it's an obstacle that we face. But, you know, it's the point I was making earlier. When you have truth and, you know, universally accepted uh, legal standards on your side, you you have to keep pursuing. And we are hoping that the more evidence we collect and we present, and as, as I was mentioning, we have a sort of a wider and a different mandate than the ones that have uh, passed before. Uh, we are hoping to convince these countries to go beyond ideology, to go beyond just a blind sort of faith in whatever Israel does. Uh, we we want to continue to expose that you know you cannot allow a country in the world to to get away with this kind of. We are also you know beginning to tackle this issue of how far you can take anti-Semitism, for example. Uh, so I, th- I think that the more work we do, the more we present. And and I don't think it's, I mean, I can tell you that uh, we have had uh, meetings at very high levels with different European Union countries, and we see a change. We see a number of countries, I don't want to name them all here, 
But we see a number of countries who are now uh, very critical, uh, very critical of Israel. But what we would like to see is to go beyond just statements uh, to actually take take action. And we are hoping that the evidence we produce, we are hoping that the issues that we raise um, will will and and the dialogues that we have with not only these countries but with their parliaments, which we will be doing. Uh, and the, their media and so on and the academics. Um, we are hoping that that will uh, that will change. And I can tell you that 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 we see we see a perceptible change. It's not something where you can be sort you know uh, just op- uh, immediately optimistic. You see you see the changes in on the campuses in the United States as well. So so we we are we are going to try to reach uh, across the aisle. We are hoping to also you know meet with. Um, people who don't agree with us. Uh, we are having regular roundtables, as I mentioned to you. We had a roundtable just two weeks ago with 20 leading um, academics and journalists and former diplomats from Jewish, the, from from inside the Green Line, who came to Geneva to speak to us. We asked them what they thought about our first report. We asked them what do they think are the issues we should cover. We will continue to do this, uh, you know. What did they say? Well, they, they generally agreed with us. They generally agreed with us. They generally um, encouraged us to continue. As you know, there are very strong voices uh, inside uh, inside Israel, including leading journalists um, and uh, and academics who are writing and were speaking out on all these issues. And in fact, uh, what is striking to us is that some of the you know um, some of the articles and analysis that you read in some of the Israeli media is is very forthright and very direct. It's 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 things that you would never read in, anywhere in the United States, for example. So so there is a voice emerging, and that's that's the voice we are trying to uh, reach out to. That's the voice we are trying to learn from. Uh, now the political process is a much more bigger obstacle inside Israel, as you know. But but uh, we are we are you know. Uh, Trying to cross the aisle, we are we are even willing, and we've had some communication even with Congress, uh, Congress people and senators in the United States. Uh, so we are we are going to try to do as much work as we can, which is well beyond just our reports. Uh, our mandate is is much beyond that. And so your next report will be uh, issued in October. Yes, it will be available. Uh, should be available by the end of September. We will present it. Uh, in October, uh, October, it's the third week of October. We'll present it to the General Assembly. We'll have, you know, press conferences. We're also going to have try to have roundtables in the U.S. We may be visiting some of the campuses to speak to the students, um, and we are hoping to do some other, you know, uh, public meetings and work uh, when we are in the. We are, we are going to be in the United States for about two weeks. Maloon Katari, thank you so much for uh, for joining me today. Yeah, thanks very much for your work. Thanks for listening to our show, a production of Mondoweiss.net. The music is from Sound of Picture. Visit our site to sign up for free daily and weekly newsletters on Palestine, Israel, and related U.S. politics. If you're enjoying our podcast, please consider becoming a donor by visiting Mondoweiss.net slash donate. Mondo Weiss is a nonprofit publication, and every donation of any amount helps sustain our work. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen, and please leave a rating and review to help other listeners find our show. <laughs>